that everybody? Welcome to the Committee of the Whole Meeting of the City Council. Today is October 27th, 2021. This meeting now comes to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Yes, Your Honor. Before I call the roll, Council Member Welsh is just arriving. <laughs> Here he comes. Come on down. Say, that was nice. Mayor Gunter? Here. Council Members Costin? Here. Hayden? Here. Long? Here. Nelson? Here. Shepard? Here. Tate? Here. Welsh? Here. Eight present. We'll move on to uh, item four is business. 4A is citizens' input. Citizens' input time, there's a maximum of 60 minutes is set for input of citizens on matters concerning city government, three minutes per individual. Please remember to state your name for the record. If you are going to participate in citizens' input, we're going to use the podium to the left. Seeing none, citizens' input is now closed. We'll move on to item 4B, discussion. At the request of the city manager, we are going to take up the uh, topic of the charter school management options first. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, uh, members of city council. I'm going to ask Connie Barron, assistant city manager, to make her way up to the podium um, to go into greater um, in-depth discussion on uh, charter school management options. But let me at least set the table for you. Um, if you remember back in February uh, of this year, as we held a, um, a joint meeting of the City Council and the Budget Review Committee, and I also think we also had members of the Charter School Governing Board in attendance that day, you discussed a series of issues related to the um, operation and performance of the City's Charter School uh, system. Uh, particularly, um, Assistant City Manager Barron presented to you some financial projections that looked at the financial performance of the charter school systems over a period of time. Um, you were very concerned about that, and, um, and as such, you directed staff to make a series of recommendations to you um, to deal with that issue. And of course, with the adoption of the fiscal year 22 budget, we've essentially dealt with that issue um, um, effectively. You then directed staff to uh, do a little bit of homework, a little bit of research, and determine if there were any opportunities out there for you to consider a different management approach to the current approach, which involves the governing, uh, the governing um, a board's of, um, authority over the charter school management you directed staff to look at providing more of the administ administra uh, what I like to call administrative slash back of the house um, functions, meaning maintenance, um, information technology, things of that nature, so the charter school can focus on what they do best, which is education. And they do a fantastic job at that, as evidenced by the recent uh, performance reports that, that we have seen. And then lastly, you asked us to, to go out and determine if there was uh, any interest in the marketplace to consider an alternative management approach, which would be to essentially to contract with a third party to come in and provide the management services for the city's charter school system. And so what we are doing today, Mr. Mayor, is essentially reporting back to you on that assignment that you gave us. And that is, is there any interest in the industry to provide uh, management services for the charter school system? And with that, I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Assistant City Manager Barron and she can uh, fill in the gaps. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. Um, Connie Barron, Assistant City Manager, as the City Manager just spoke about, we followed the process uh, that was directed by City Council back in February. We issued a request for information to see whether or not 
there was any interest in, out in the um, community, out in the education world, uh, to come forward and do any management of the uh, charter schools. Uh, we received two, two responses to that request for information. One was from Charter Schools USA, and the other one was from the YMCA. The YMCA offer, uh, does operate a few schools in, in the area. Um, we reviewed the request for information, and both of, this, both of these proposers are qualified to provide services to the charter schools, the type of services that City Council had asked about, as well as even beyond that, as the Charter Schools USA goes beyond that and even handles the educational part of it. Um, with the RFI, we're able to gather information on A, whether there are qualified um, proposers out there, and B, what we would have to do in order to get a quote or a more uh, idea what the cost would be. In order to do that, we would have to go out for an RFP, the request for proposals. So they provided us enough information in here that we could craft a request for proposals and go out, out and select or search for, um, uh, seek out proposals from Charter Schools USA, YMCA, or any other entity that might have an interest in it. And that would have more uh, cost and let us know what, what it would actually um, uh, cost us to move forward with this type of uh, operation of the schools. Um, the question for city council is whether or not you want to proceed on that, on that route. And the reason we ask that question is because doing a request for proposals is staff intensive as well as proposer intensive. There's a lot of work that goes into putting together requests for proposals and RFP. Uh, it could be a minimum of three months before we would have that put together, probably longer, and it would be several more months before we would even have uh, any type of proposal that we could pr present to council. At the same time, we have moved forward, as council directed us to do, to begin uh, taking over, for lack of a better term, some of those back the back office type work, where we're doing more of the, um, the custodial services, the IT management, some of the financial management. Uh, we're maintaining the buses, so we're trying to um, let the charter schools focus on the things that they do best, which is educate the kids. And you can tell by some of the reports that we're receiving that that's, that's something that the charter schools do very, very well. Uh, we have very high-rated schools. They're very respected schools. And our teachers and the administrators do a, a wonderful job with the kids. What we're doing here in what we call the year of transition is we're looking at the operational side of it. And we are uh, taking a greater role in that. We can continue to do that. And we can also still do an RFP if that is the council's desire. Um, but that really is a discussion that we would like to have with city council and to find out whether or not they want us just to proceed as we have been um, during this transition year, evaluating the services and see where we can go from there in partnership, or would they prefer that we go ahead and do the request for proposals and look for an outside entity to actually uh, run and manage the schools. And by, by the way, on an RFI, request for information, you cannot award uh, any contract based on just an RFI. You do have to do a request for proposals. So I'm here to answer any questions from that standpoint. Wanda Roop is here to answer any questions you might have with regard to the RFP process. And I know that uh, Superintendent Collins is here as well. Thank you, Council Member Cosden. Thank you, Mayor. Connie, do you recall, I think it was 2018 or 2019, we went through this process. We yeah. got prices, I think, from at least two private management companies. We sort of got, RFP. we sort of got, I'll say we sort of got prices. It they, was, yeah, I, Charter Schools USA was one of them, but we really didn't get a detailed pricing from them. Um, because at that point in time, there wasn't a big push. I, I know this was when uh, John Zerlag was still here too. Uh, so we had gone out and we'd asked Charter Schools USA. We met with one of their representatives and they, they provided some information but they were not real forthcoming on giving us any really concrete pricing. That's why when you see on the RFI, you're not seeing any concrete pricing on that either. They're, you're, they're giving us an estimate somewhere in the 15% range of, of um, the, the cost of uh, 
of providing those services, that 15% of what the uh, revenues take in, what they take in. So we did go out and we asked the questions, but we didn't get really concrete price, and we got some really rough estimates. And those rough estimates show that it would have been grossly irresponsible to go that route. So I'm not going to support an RFP. I don't want to give our tax money to a for-profit charter school mm -hmm. uh, management company. Mm -hmm. So I'm very against that. Yeah, and just for clarification, so you know, it wouldn't be our quote, you know, it's, it's sort of our tax money, mm -hmm. but it actually does come out of the FEF piece money from the state. Yes, our so, collective yeah, tax right, money. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I won't be supporting that. Thank you. So. Council Member Tate. Thank you. Thanks, Connie, for the information and having reviewed those uh, two plans with the RFIs. Um, the information was helpful, but it doesn't sway the idea. And the time frame that you're giving us, it's three to six months. We're in the middle of a school year. And to start letting parents now think that we're going to do something different, this is what happened under a former mayor and a former city manager. There was not a black eye, but there was some negative publicity, and it hurt the schools more than it helped them. And this is not what we want to do, not coming off of COVID. So I would strongly uh, be against going out for an RFP at this time. I think the city is just starting to take the back end operation. It's just starting to get its feet wet. Let's see how that works out. Let's fight for the half cent sales tax. Let's stay on the path that we're on and let's put a good foot forward for the parents that are productively working. I mean, we have a really good foundation. They raised thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in the golf tournament. It's not a huge amount of money, but there are parents that are diligently working to support these schools. And the last thing we want to do is say, hey, we're going to change again midstream and, and make them not be comfortable with these. So for me, um, and I know we have principals out here as well as our superintendent, I would like to support them and continue on the path that we are on and make it as successful as we can. Thank you. Councilmember Hayden. <clears throat> yeah, I'm definitely against sending this out for um, proposal. I think what's happening ac academically at these schools and how they're enriching the kids is uh, extraordinary. And I applaud you for uh, all the teachers, principals, administrators that are here today for what's happen happening academically at our schools. I don't think uh, charter schools as a for-profit, as Councilmember Cousins said, I don't think in, in any way, shape, or form they come close academically to providing what we're, what we're giving, what we're giving now. What I would support, however, is uh, bringing the financial management of the schools under um, uh, the city's purview. I think the audits have made some recommendations that uh, <coughs> um, um, cause you to take notice. And, you know, I really believe that you all, you all are in the education business, not the financial business. So I think uh, uh, the assistance should come from the financial side, but academically, uh, please continue your good work. Thank you. Council Member Nelson. I guess I look at it differently. Um, I, you know, I don't even, I mean, I, I remember what Council Member Cosden was referring to when <clears throat> we did get some information from Charter Schools USA and it was not um, financially feasible didn't make sense. Um, the YMCA, however, I'm very familiar with that organization, know that they've had multiple years experience in running charter schools and given that we are potentially looking at bringing them into our community, I think it's a good possibility. Um, I go back to the feasibility or the sustainability study that the former city manager did that showed a bleak outlook and although I know, you know, we're hoping to get money from the half cent sales tax, um, you know, that's just not a sure thing right now. And so what I don't want to see happen is that we are caught again in a situation where there's panic mode and, you know, there's talk, uh, you know, amongst individuals and, and the schools and the parents and, and council and everyone in town um, regarding, you know, oh my gosh, we're going to have to close a school because we don't want to do that either. I mean, these schools are, have proven to be, you know, stellar schools in, in our community. I just don't know that um, our city should be managing all of it. I like the idea of offering this, uh, potentially looking at uh, this nonprofit, especially the YMCA, because they are financially um, sustainable. They've got tons of funding and funders. They've been around since the late 60s. Um, you know, they span uh, support over, over three counties. 
and I just think it's worth looking looking at. So I would support an RFP at least, um, you know, for sure with the YMCA, um, and and maybe there's other contenders out there that we don't even know about. But having looked at these two, um, hands down, I would support the YMCA just investigating that and looking at it because everything that I've seen in the almost five years that I've sat in this chair and the two years I spent. Um, on the governing board for the charter school uh, showed, you know, us a very bleak outlook in terms of sustainability long term. And I just, I don't want that panic mode in our community. I don't want that panic mode with our parents and our staff. Um, I would rather be ready uh, to go with another option in case the, the sales tax um, uh, route does not come to fruition. That concerns me. Um, I don't want to put all of our eggs in that basket. I just got uh, a phone call actually when I was on my way here um, from a concerned resident who read an article about us transferring that um, from the, was it the PST for the budget? Yeah, where we transferred that um, rebate, if you will, or that that um, savings and, and we decided that we would give, you know, the, the $2 million annually to the charter schools. Um, I just got, um, you know, an earful and a tongue lashing from a retired uh, school teacher in Lee County, you know, reminding me that when these schools were, were formed, we promised we wouldn't uh, go to the taxpayer for their money. And she was very upset and, you know, and uh, I apologized, you know, tried to explain <clears throat> as best I could our support for our schools because our name's on the door and, you know, they're great schools, um, but she wasn't having it. So I just think that this is a, a great option B and I would like to see us at least explore it. Thank you. Council Member Welsh. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I see everyone's opinion, and I kind of agree with, with everyone here, but uh, I'm looking at it from a different standpoint as well. Uh, the, other, the other two entities that the city has, we put out for an RFP. Um, I personally didn't think we needed it on those. Uh, but people don't think we need it here in the charter school, but the charter school is losing money. It is a debt incurred. We did just take away an exemption to help cover the debt of the buildings, I believe, not, not to cover the charter schools themselves, because I believe we're not taxing. For the schools, we're taxing to cover the debt on the building. So we do have debt there, and we're, as a city, on the line to pay for it. So I... I I want to see how with the city managing the financials. I like what Tom said that there was some audit stuff that came through. Uh, I'd like to see how that continues to maybe enhance the schools and work on bringing their, their not enhance the schools, but enhance the, the debt that, that the school has. So I, I do want to see an RFP. I don't know right now. I'd like to see how, how it works. It might be too soon for it. Um, I don't think it's going to get the support, but like the mayor said, uh, I want to see all the options in front of me, like he did with the golf course. So until I see all the options and I know what the price is and I know that it's bad, if we've got, you know, something from two years ago, I could look at that. But if, you know, things have changed. So I would like to see an RFP, but I also want to see the, how things are going now that we're taking over some of the administrative stuff. Thank you. Council Member Cosden. I just wanted to ask if staff could share that data from a couple years back with all of council. Yes, I'll, I'll find that data and get it to you. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, when you take a look at all of our options, honestly, I think we should have had this conversation before we as a council voted uh, on an alternative financial uh, possibility as far as the public service tax. So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here kind of thinking we put the cart before the horse there, but in any event, we are where we are in time. Um, when you take a look at the uh, RFIs that were uh, presented, uh, like staff had stated, I think uh, both of those uh, entities are qualified, uh, but I think we need to take a look at it. I, I think we kind of drew a, a, draw, a, a line in the sand when we came up with a alternative as far as income for the, uh, for the charter schools. So in my opinion, I think we're past the question that you're asking for me. So I think that uh, 
you know, when I was looking uh, at that a few weeks ago when we were having that discussion, in my mind, was that we would uh, keep control of the charter schools here at the city and look how we could help them financially. And I think uh, staff did a good job in bringing that forward for us. Now, with that being said, as far as uh, what Councilmember Welsh said about taking a look at P3s uh, or uh, any type of other uh, contractual uh, uh, obligation that we may have with any of our, our facilities, whether it's charter schools or the golf course, I think you have to uh, look at that on a case-by-case -case basis and see what's, what's the best for that particular topic. Uh, so when I take a look at this, uh, I'm in favor of moving forward with the city keeping control uh, of the charter schools. With that being said, uh, I think what we need to do is take a look at what's going to be the city's responsibility and what is going to be staff as far as the charter school's responsibility. As mentioned today, they're doing an excellent job uh, as far as the educational aspect. And I think that's what they're good at. And that's what they should continue to do. And I thank them for the hard work that they're, that they're doing. And when you look at the grades and, and uh, everything that we've seen here recently, we know they're doing a great job. Uh, the financial aspect, like Council Member Hayden said, I think there's room for improvement uh, in that area. So I think when you take a look at some of the things that I know staff has identified in the past, whether it's the Human Resources Department, uh, IT, facilities, transportation, whatever that may be, if we're going to take over control in those areas, then I think one thing that we have to do is take a look at uh, chapter 26 that governs the responsibilities uh, of the charter schools and what their responsibilities are and what the city's responsibilities. If we're going to move forward in this partnership is what I will call it uh, between the charter schools and the city, I think we have to make sure that it's crystal clear of what the charter school's responsibilities are and what the city's responsibilities. And that only, that goes to say with the charter school governing board and the city council. We have to make sure that's crystal clear uh, because I would hate to go down a path and we may come up with an understanding now, but we have to make sure it's specifically spelled out in chapter 26, no matter who sits in these chairs or who's, who the superintendent is or who the governing board members are. We have to make sure it's extremely crystal clear of what everybody's responsibilities are. So if we're going to go down this path, uh, I think uh, sooner rather than later, we have to identify those responsibilities and make sure we put it in ordinance form similar to what we did earlier on with Chapter 26. So I'm okay moving forward. Uh, I appreciate the work that staff did on the RFI. I received enough information myself when I looked at the two uh, proposals uh, and also uh, realizing that we had just uh, identified an additional revenue source uh, for the charter schools. Um, I'm okay with moving forward and keeping control of the charter schools at this time, but with the caveat that we identify each party's responsibility and make sure that we move forward in, in that fashion. So that's, uh, that's how I see it. Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Madam City Attorney, if I recall 2017, 2018, Council Member Stout, who sat next to me, um, asked for a second, help me out if y'all remember, she asked for a second to work on Chapter 26 to make sure it was in line and that it was updated. Did that ever come to fruition that you recall? Chapter 26 has not been, I don't think it's been revised since that time. It was, it was I think it was put as, as part of a um, multi-tiered effort of approaching the charter school issue. One being its financial situation, um, another being looking at the lease, which 
we have reason to believe you will probably be seeing come before you the restructuring of the lease. Um, I believe for introduction, I think at the second meeting in November and probably for public hearing in uh, your first meeting in December and then chapter 26. Um, and certainly there are some changes that could be made to chapter 26. Um, and I think that possibly there are some conversations that could be held with respect to uh, what changes might be beneficial with regard to chapter 26 and, and what changes might have unintended consequences if we were to make them. Um, so we, the city manager and I have been talking as well as the staff about the possibility of, of possibly having some one-on-ones with council as well and, and delving into chapter 26 a little bit more deeply. Am I stating that correctly? I would, I would say, with that said, I, would, I think you're right. I think one of us needs to take that on and get a second to do it. Right, right. But then I would also say maybe we would want to put sort of a small task force together that also involves some um, uh, Superintendent Collins and maybe, some, maybe um, another staff member, maybe a parent. I don't, I don't know, maybe just a task force so that we are considering all uh, stakeholders that are involved in the charter schools. With that said, um, again, you know, my only concern is, is and uh, Connie, if you could please send us that sustainability feasibility study that was done a few years back financially so that the new council members can see the bleak outlook that we were given and why we're even having this conversation today. Um, but I, you know, I would be, uh, I, would, I would think that yes, we would need to redo look at chapter 26, involve every stakeholder that we can, and then um, show all the council what that feasibility study looked like long term. Um, because I think that's gonna help educate the newer members up here. Um, you know, and, and as we're sitting here talking about chapter 26, it dawned on me that council member Stout did ask for a second on that, but you're right, Mayor. I don't, I don't think anything ever came of it, obviously not. So let's go there, let's work on that and then, um, um, as, as my colleagues have said, uh, you know, absolutely, I think we should take over business operations, but I think we need to know, everybody up here needs to understand the cost of that and why, again, why we even uh, ask staff to do the RFI. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention, uh, I do recall, uh, as Council Member Nelson said, that uh, Council Member Stout did get a second to work on that. I think, uh, and that was probably back in about 2018. And I think what had happened was there, we were looking at, or staff was looking at uh, some opportunities or uh, some options that we may have. So I think at that time, uh, the uh, direction that was uh, given uh, with council member Stout was, I think hold off, let's, let's take a look at our options that we have on the table first before we move forward on uh, making any uh, modifications to chapter 26. Now, the, uh, I think one of the uh, reports that was given to us in 2018, I believe it was Stantec uh, yes. that provided that uh, financial uh, forecast. Right. I think that would be something that would be advantageous for this council mm -hmm. uh, to update yeah. that because- Yeah, and we do have the updated one. And, we showed that and to I council think in that February, we, yes. We need to incorporate that uh, monies that we've approved this uh, physical year, this budget time, right. as far as in the PST. Right. That way we have a good, full, updated understanding mm -hmm. of what the financial uh, future may be. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that would be uh, great information to have mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, even if we decide to, to uh, keep the, uh, the charter schools as far as the uh, management's concerned, uh, I think uh, having that financial uh, future outlook will be important for us to make future decisions. So that, that would be great information. Sure. Great information to have. Uh, Council Member Long. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, much of what's been said here by my colleagues today. I think for me, having uh, three young children, uh, the oldest of which is, is about to enter into uh, the school system, I think it, 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 none of us are questioning. It's hard to argue with the end product here, which is that the... Uh, the, the outlook that they've been able to do academically and the achievement that, uh, that they've made, um, you know, far and away, every time that we've asked anybody that's got kids in the school systems uh, locally, you know, where we should maybe potentially place my daughter that's entering into kindergarten has been Oasis. 
Um, you know, I look at the superintendent's interim report in October, uh, was very impressed with, um, you know, what was presented in that. I think on the back end, though, is, is where the issues come. And so, you know, in a business sense, and it's not necessarily a business, is there's been many well-intentioned businesses um, and potentially, you know, world-changing businesses that have done great things, but have failed uh, because they operate in the red. And so that's an issue that I think that we're on the right path in, in addressing. Um, I'd be interested in following some of what's been suggested here with regards to making sure on the back end that those issues are, are buttoned up and we're not just continuing to throw cash at it to patch the leak. And, and rather, I think we should put some efforts in place to um, fix the leak. So I think uh, we're in the right direction. At this point, I wouldn't be um, on board with, with going towards an RFP. Uh, I think we continue down uh, the road that was been discussed with regards to Chapter 26 and, um, and those discussions. Thank you. Council Member Tate. Just on Chapter 26, um, I think that the idea that uh, the city attorney and the city manager are working together, having conversations, and then they're going to meet with us one-on-one, -on -one, and then let's see where that is before we get the stakeholder group, and the stakeholder group should have a board member from the Charter School Authority and the superintendent, possibly principals, but we're further down the line yet. I still think that we need to gather information and meet with them one-on-one -on -one and each of us see what we put in there. And I would just ask council to please take the word bleak out of your vocabulary when you're talking about the charter schools because um, that can become a headline that our parents really don't need to see. Thank you. Council Member Hayden. Yeah, I guess I was going to ask Council Member Nelson for some clarification because when you use the word bleak, that also could refer to what was happening academically, which certainly isn't the case. But we're talking if about bleak, finances. If I have the floor. If bleak referred to um, the financial status, it, that has changed because of the money the Council um, <clears throat> approved to help pay down the debt, which we were going to still have, whether we invested in another group looking into this or not. That was still, that was still going to be there. So. I think bleak has been shaved a bit because uh, you know we take on the responsibility of some of that debt. I just wanted to make sure that's what you were referring to when you when you use that term. Hundred percent. Councilmember Shepard. Yeah, I, I agree. We've taken on the responsibility, and rather than repeat, I I agree with Councilmember Mayor with what the mayor said. And what okay. Sorry, my mic was off. No, I'm, uh, I'm in agreement with what the mayor has said and uh, Councilman uh, Hayden has said, so I don't want to repeat everything, but I'm in agreement with their, their path. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other lights on. Uh, Mr. City Manager, you get the direction you're looking for. So, Mr. Mayor, let me just uh, repeat back to you what I think I heard um, in terms of uh, direction for staff. Number one, it seems to me that there is no appetite for city council to move forward with a, an RFP for a third party operator. Um, you do want us to continue our staff level efforts to revise chapter 26. And then based on the conversation here, once we have that initial draft, then we come back to you for discussion. And at that point, you'll, you'll give us further direction in terms of whether we move forward with um, organizing a group of stakeholders to begin um, reviewing the draft uh, revisions that come out of the Chapter 26 um, review process. Um, you asked us for additional information regarding the 2018 um, uh, report or framework that was put together, um, I think, between Mr. Zerlag and Superintendent Collins. You asked us to also work with Stantec to update the financial projections to reflect the, the new um, fiscal realities of, of the charter school system, which um, are, are stable now. And they're stable going into the foreseeable future. So that's the message that I definitely want to convey here, that the, the charter school is financially stable for the foreseeable future, due in part to the decisions that you made as part of the FY22 budget process. So I've heard all that. We will begin working on those assignments. Um, just thinking out loud here, I'm thinking that maybe we bring this back to you, and certainly with the financial projections from Stantec, um, we're penciling in for late January a um, winter retreat slash budget kickoff. And um, 
this might be a suitable moment since we're going to be talking about things that are financially um, related to bring it back to you during your winter retreat. So that'll be late January. That's what we're going to strive for to have all this inf information complete and ready to go. If we can get it to you sooner, we will certainly do that. Um, but for now, let's plan on, you know, another discussion like this for, for that winter retreat. Does that sound good? Okay, and before I move on to the next topic, uh, since uh, Superintendent Collins uh, came to the meeting and, and your staff, I want to give you the opportunity, anything you would like to add to the conversation that uh, maybe we hadn't mentioned up to this point. Good afternoon, Council. Jackie Collins, Superintendent of the Oasis Charter Schools. I think uh, Council has a very good understanding of um, what, a, what an EMO would look like. Uh, we have to remember that EMOs are for-profit organizations. So in our educational setting, there is no room for profit in our budget. Um, and that's something that would need to be considered. In addition to the debt, you would have uh, a profit-based management company coming in um, who really is ultimately, you'd be relinquishing control to that company to run the school system. Um, and that, that to us would present a problem. Um, and usually when you have EMOs, they run um, organizations remotely, so they're not a part of the local culture. And the great thing about our school system is that we are part of the city and we understand each other's cultures because we live here together. And I think that's very important for oversight that we understand each other and we work together because culture is um, intricately related um, into the educational process in the classroom. Uh, so I think the council really has a good understanding of why this was not a good place, way to go. I think our families will be very appreciative because that's not the avenue they want to go down. Um, they like the school system as it is. They like the community feel. I think we're in a very good place and moving forward, we are looking forward to working with the city. I think that is the best absolute alternative for our charter school system. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments for Council, uh, Superintendent Collins? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll move on to our next topic. Uh, Mr. S City Manager, annexation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Cotero to come to the podium and his staff to walk you through a brief presentation on the overall issue of annexation. And let me start the conversation by answering the question which is why are we even having this conversation, right? Why is annexation an issue for you to consider? Um, it's an issue for you and has been an issue for, for the city because we have, um, in the city's development over the last 50 years, have um, been stymied or have had to make decisions um, even though we have pockets of unincorporated areas that are completely surrounded by the city of Cape Coral, um, that you have no influence or no ability to um, help govern. So you don't, do not have the ability to um, address land use issues in these areas. Um, you don't have the ability right now to provide them with utility services or public safety services. And in fact, you've had to go out of your way to bypass these areas in order to extend um, vital infrastructure to other areas of the city. And one can argue that in some of these um, enclaves, some of which are developed and have a, a, um, a, um, a scattering of single family homes, and others are undeveloped properties, but one can argue that for those areas that are developed, the residents in those areas are using city-funded services and infrastructure. They're getting the benefit of city services and infrastructure, and they're not having to pay for it because they're completely surrounded by the city of Cape Coral, and they've got to drive on streets that are maintained and, and operated by the city of Cape Coral, and again, they don't have to pay for it. And so I think there's a, the, the, the broader issue here is what's right from a public policy perspective and what's fair in terms of whether these um, isolated 
um, and geographically separated from um, their municipal service provider, in this case it would be Lee County government acting as a municipality rather than as a regional government, that's who their municipal service provider is. And so the question is, is it fair, is it time for us to once again have this conversation like we've had in the past um, to address this issue to number one, ensure that city services are provided and funded equally amongst those that benefit um, from those services. And it helps us address the issues that we're dealing with in terms of planning for infrastructure investments and for the provision of services on a daily basis. And so we're going to have Vince come to the podium. He's going to lead you through a real quick discussion on annexation. We have our fire chief here, our police chief here, our department directors, and they can speak to you firsthand on the challenges that they um, have to endure on a daily basis when you're having all of these pockets um, that are surrounded by the city and they're having to make decisions, um, uh, uh, split second decisions as to whether they're gonna send a police unit there or a fire unit there um, because there is um, some confusion as to whether what jurisdiction that property happens to fall in. And so what we're trying to do here is have the conversation and get direction from council um, as to what direction you want to head in and then we're going to describe for you the options that are available to you and hopefully you'll give us some direction and we can start um, working on this issue if in fact this is something that you want to work towards. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Vince and Bob Peterson. They're going to give you a real quick overview of annexation, state statutes, processes related to annexation and uh, then we'll answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Um, as Mr. Hernandez said, th these issues that we're dealing with are a little bit different than cities and counties have to deal with in areas where there is a lot of growth potential, where you've got rural areas or areas of cities that haven't been developed and want to annex more, or cities that are um, newly formed. This is more of a zoning and land use issues from our vantage point. And as Mr. Hernandez said, it impacts the services. There are three major issues here that we, we look at. One is the impact of services, two is land use of the property, and three is zoning. It's, it's a different type of issue than other municipalities may have to look at when they are competing for services with larger um, parcels of land in unincorporated counties or even in adjoining cities for that matter. So we're going to show a quick PowerPoint and show you these areas. Um, Mr. Hernandez used the term in his discussion of enclaves. Bob's going to go through that, tell you what they mean, give you the ins and outs of each parcel. In your packet for your reference in your files is a white paper that actually explains the terminology that we use that is grounded in state statute on what the rules of the game are and how you want to um, and what you have to uh, play by if you're annexing land. But keep in mind as we go through this discussion that each one of these parcels is unique and we want to assure even if they remain in unincorporated Lee County that there is compatibility with the county in terms of land use and zoning and that can become an issue. You would think in a pure world that if we have a piece of property that's owned commercial and there's a piece in the middle and then we have a piece of property on the other side east and west on a major road a piece in the middle is going to be commercial it always isn't the case so that's that's where the land use and zoning process comes in and of course the other side is the services but each one of these is unique the configuration um, the research that we've done where billboards exist because that's an issue in our our sign code as you know so Bob's going to go through that, and as Mr. Hernandez said, we have our department heads here to answer questions on the impact to their departments, depending on the action you take. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Robert Peterson for the Commun um, Development Services Department. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the process for annexations, some of the background of annexations in the city, and then we'll uh, go and review the maps that show uh, potential enclaves and annexation areas and around. 
<clears throat> they're governed primarily by Chapter 171 Florida statutes. There are four ways in which a municipality can annex land into its, its, its fold by a special act of the legislature. That means the, we would work, for example, with our legislative delegation, develop a special act and detail the properties to be annexed, what the process would be, the legal descriptions for those parcels, and so forth. And if a bill was passed by both sessions of the legislature, um, both houses, and approved by the governor, then those properties would become annexed in to the municipality. It can be a voluntary annexation. Uh, you saw one of those very recently on your agenda. Uh, that's where the property owner petitions to be annexed into the city and they're adjacent to existing city boundaries and they meet the qualifications of not creating enclaves and other things. An involuntary annexation where the governing body would pass an ordinance to annex a piece of property and that would trigger uh, absent of request from the property owner and that would trigger a referendum um, that requires the majority of the property owners within that area proposed to be annexed to vote in the affirmative to be annexed into that jurisdiction. And the fourth way is by an interlocal agreement with the county. And I'll touch on those briefly. Uh, the voluntary requires unanimous consent of the property owners. There's notice and hearing requirements set forth in the statute, including, as you know, a, a, oops, a public hearing before the council. And the area must be contiguous to the city, reasonably compact, suitable for urban development, and not create an enclave. And that enclave is the stickiest one for many annexations as they, uh, we talk about them. Involuntary is where you would adopt an ordinance to annex property, even if the property owners haven't requested to do so. And the ordinance cannot become effective until a majority of the electors in the area to be annexed vote for the annexation, and that vote must occur in a referendum within 30 days following the adoption of the annexation ordinance. So if you chose that route to annex a piece of property, you'd also have to be very careful about the timing of that because presumably you wouldn't want to have to have a special election and all the costs associated with that just uh, for an annexation parcel. So there could be a timing issue associated with that as well. Interlocal agreement or also is called annexation by contract. This is for enclaves may be annexed by an agreement between the city and the county. This is limited to uh, sites of less than 25 registered voters and less than 10 acres. They cannot be developed or improved and must meet the definition of an enclave in the statute. And we have several parcels you'll see that would meet this definition as we work through the maps. Uh, presume the requirements to do this are not specifically spelled out in statute. Presumably there'd be a resolution calling for the annexation with both governing bodies. And, and then another uh, hearing on the uh, interlocal agreement itself uh, to annex those properties. The fourth uh, area, the special act by the legislature, as I indicated, a bill is introduced to annex the property and any conditions or criteria for that annexation. If approved by the House and Senate and signed by the governor, the property is annexed into the city. So those are your, those are your four pathways to possibly annex property. In the past, or since incorporation in 1970, 18 voluntary annexations have been approved uh, by the city, adding some 5.22 square miles of land to the city. Uh, the largest of these by size, uh, what we call the Zemmel property, Zemmel Northeast up along 41 and uh, sort of in the central part of the city and over towards uh, Burnt Store Road. The city, to uh, my knowledge, or anyone who's been here a lot longer than I have, has never attempted an involuntary annexation uh, and the city has also not attempted an annexation through an interlocal agreement with the county. In about 2003, well it was in 2003, the legislature passed a special act to annex most of the enclaves into Cape Coral. This bill was vetoed by the governor even after passing both houses, largely due to opposition from the affected property owners involved and that died and, and nothing more was done with that. Um, two recent uh, applications for annexation are under review and we'll be reaching your uh, hearing here in due course. Both of these are enclaves along Southwest Pine Island Road. Following an annexation, 
it isn't all over. Uh, the property owner then must apply to establish a city future land use classification under our comprehensive plan. And once the future land use application is adopted, a rezone is necessary to have city zoning come onto the property rather than Lee County zoning. And then the annex property would be ready for development, um, site plans, building permits, whatever the case would be to, to move forward. Um, a lot of the property in Lee County is uh, in an agricultural type classification, the, the enclaves that we have. And as Vince was mentioning, that can be a uh, kind of a disconnect, if you will, if you think of a, a, a busy arterial roadway in the city is slated for commercial type development, and then you have a piece that's slated for agriculture type development, those uses, and then you pick up with the city again. So it can create an inconsistency in your land use pattern. We're gonna run through a series of maps and we, we show the enclaves, and we also uh, show areas that are adjacent to the city that uh, may be considered enclaves or perhaps areas that one day may want to annex into the city. We're starting at the western edge of the city on Pine Island Road. Um, uh, working from the left, you have Mount Lachey Isles, a fully developed subdivision that is surrounded on three sides by the city, and um, that's... Oh, Hit that button, I apologize. That's the first item. Then there's an area just southeast of there, uh, right where Veterans Parkway comes up to meet Pine Island Road. The first two parcels to the west of Veterans Parkway are in the city, but then the remainder of that property is in the county. And there have been very recent discussions with a potential developer who's very interested in developing that property to the west of the current city boundary, um, but that enclave there where there's a, uh, a landscaping type business, I believe, and a church, um, um, were not part of the property that the developer is considering, or not all of that property, and to annex part of it would create an enclave. So there are active discussions going on that we've heard about between a potential development entity and the property owners there about uh, potentially um, annexing some of that property. Then moving uh, to the east, the parcel outlined in green, that is a pending application for an annexation at this time. So that would bring that property in. So the, the four corners of that intersection at least would all be within uh, city land use, city zoning, and, and uh, other city controls. To the south of that is uh, Royal T. You're aware of that. That's a large golf course community that is in an unincorporated County. North of Royal T, you'll see a very uh, non consistent pattern there. There are uh, individual parcels that are in Lee County, uh, a few of those, then there, uh, there's a, some that are in the city, then a finger of land that's uh, entrance to Royal T is in the county, and so forth. So you have sort of a, a mixed match there as you move across. Uh, the north side of royalty properties are in the properties that are not. We have detailed parcel level data on every one of those parcels if you want to get into exactly which one and what its status is. But so there's a, some enclaves in there for sure uh, that could be looked at. Moving further to the east on the north side, you have a, a two parcels there that are immediately west of the FPNL property that. Um, sort of used for outdoor storage at this time, and those are in unincorporated Lee County, and those are certainly an enclave uh, that could be looked at for annexation. A little bit further to east of that, the, the large site, which is often known as the mall site, apparently there was a mall proposal there some years back, there is a, a piece of property there that uh, outlined in green that is in process for annexation. That's under the same ownership of that larger piece of property just to the north of it. And then just to the south of it is the other uh, piece of that property that was not included in that application when it came in. To the south of that, you have, you have two parcels that with frontage on Pine Island Road that are in unincorporated Lee County with city boundaries on all four sides of that. And then you have what's uh, the enclave of Saddlewood Farms, and that's a rural residential sort of subdivision. They're outlined in red. Uh, generally five, ten acre parcels that are in unincorporated Lee County. Now, if you go north quite a bit from where we were 
up Old Burnt Store Road, and then a little bit to the east is uh, Sand Road, and there are uh, a total enclave of six parcels there that uh, in Lee County. I guess they were opposed to the city uh, formation of the city, original incorporation, and were left out, or they were desired to be left out, and they're not part of the city. Then also a little further east of that, on Nelson Road, just west of Nelson Road, are four, uh, again, agricultural type parcels, three of which have uh, residences on them that are in unincorporated Lee County. Everything around them is in the city. Coming back down towards Pine Island Road, you'll uh, see a parcel here a little bit west of Nicholas Parkway on the north side of Pine Island. Uh, that is an enclave that is, is in unincorporated Lee County, and that also has one of the sites that has a billboard. Then as you move quite a bit further east, um, the very northwest corner of the slide here is Pine Island Road, Northeast Pine Island Road, and then Pondella Road uh, going through the middle of your slide. If you look there, there's a, a sort of a rural type old subdivision where it's mix and match, it's a checkerboard. Uh, all the ones outlined in red are enclave parcels in unincorporated Lee County. Uh, the other properties are in the city. And there was a recent annexation right there at the very north of those parcels uh, where they meet Pine Island Road. That They're still uh, waiting for final approval of that from the state and then we can move forward with the land use and uh, zoning for that parcel. Again on the south side of Pondall Road there's another enclave. I apologize I don't know the name of that subdivision but it's all platted into individual lots and then uh, on the south side of Bryn Mawr Drive is another series of six or eight lots there and a couple of larger parcels that are all in unincorporated Lee County, all surrounded by the city. Working further out, Pine Island Road, uh, you'll see on the, the far right, the large um, piece outlined in red, that's Judd Creek, that is in the city. And that is developing, as you know, the Springs development uh, opened not very long ago. And to the west of that, is a uh, property that's at least on two and three sides, two or three sides, depending on where you're looking, uh, not in the city of Cape Coral. That's uh, outlined, the uh, red outline there. And there have been uh, some annexations of that property, particularly in the northwest corner, where there's a little carve out. And there have been a number of discussions over the years about annexing more of this property. Uh, but the concern has always been, if you did that, uh, you make an enclave by cutting off that subdivision on the western side of this polygon uh, where there's about six, eight, six or eight uh, homes and properties there. So there, there have been certainly been development interest, interest in coming into the city, interesting in annexing this property, but they face that problem, that enclave of those residential homes. And then there's a series of lots to the north just on the west side of Corbett Road that are all in unincorporated Lee County and everything else around them is in the city. I have, I have one more. If you go up Northeast 24th Avenue, there's a subdivision that's sort of isolated from everything. Um, uh, Garden, Gar Garden Boulevard Enclave, we uh, named it. It's north of the, the city limits or, or everything west of it, north of it, and south of it are in the city. That's part of the Yellow Creek Preserve as it goes from there on up towards Del Prado. Uh, that's north and west of that property and then property at unincorporated Lee County to the east. So those are the uh, an overview of the process and the maps that we have. We can go back to any slide you want if you want to talk about any of those or have any questions about that. Okay, I'll now open it up for council for any comments or questions. Council Member Hayden. <coughs> well, I guess to start, um, trying to determine what exactly you want us, what ty type of uh, direction you're looking for here. Are you looking for something that, uh, that we put before the legislature to annex in most of this? There's a lot of properties there, obviously. Um, are there certain ones that this um, possible legislative action would, would be specific to? Or just to kind of start the conversation, what? <clears throat> what exactly are you looking for? 
So thank you, council member. So what we are asking for is number one, um, consensus from city council as to whether or not this is a public policy issue that we need to um, devote any staff time to. Uh, and if the answer to that question is yes, then we will continue to move forward and try to de develop the most appropriate mechanism to try to deal with this issue. And what I would say is if you come back to us and you tell us, yes, this is something that you want us to work on, I think that in partnership with city council, we would then begin the process of having conversations with our counterparts over at the county to determine if any of these areas could be annexed by uh, th or through an interlocal agreement. Okay. And then also begin the process of working with our local delegation to perhaps craft a, a local bill for the 2023 legislative session to um, bring some or all of these parcels into the city. Uh, we didn't want to start spending a whole lot of time and effort into this and, and get in front of city council if city council determined that this is not an issue that you want to deal with at this time. And so again, I, um, if it is something that you want to spend some time on, we need to, to start doing some additional planning and research on the staff end in order to be able to work with the delegation to have language in place for um, the 2023 legislative session, which is for us right around the corner, yeah. right? Even though it's more than a year away. Well, I think um, <clears throat> if we could target specific areas that might be crucial to commercial development somewhere down the future, that would be great. I'm certainly not interested in royalty or Mount Lachey Isles, um, but if there's specific areas that we know benefit our growth down the future that can help start to eliminate some of this confusion with public safety and how they respond, if it factors into our UEP in some way, um, then you know, I, could, I could see that as specific targets to what we might wanna do. Um, but you know, there's so much here um, without specifying exactly uh, the benefits to any of this, um, I think it'd be very difficult for us to agree on wanting to bring at all, in fact, I think it'd be impossible. But, so that's all, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, before I open up any other uh, questions, I, just a quick question from Madam City Attorney. Could you uh, define uh, the definition of an enclave? So council is uh, crystal clear on that. <clears throat> I don't have the statute in front of me, but I believe the definition of an enclave is basically you're almost like an island that's surrounded by, um, let's say, a city or a county. Um, it, the statutes that talk about annexation contrast that with like a pocket, um, and, um, and they never define pocket. We have interpreted pocket as meaning um, potentially that you're not entirely surrounded, so we wouldn't be creating an island but that you might be like three sides some of what you see here a lot of what you see here would not be able to have been done today uh, these uh on those properties some of which probably are enclaves were created at a time when the law was different and you could create a city and leave county enclaves in your boundaries you wouldn't be able to do this today right. and the reason okay, that is there I a definition that. of enclave Enclave is any unincorporated, improved, or developed area that is enclosed within and bounded on all sides by a single municipality, or any unincorporated, improved, or developed area that is enclosed within and bounded by a single municipality and a natural or man-made obstacle that allows the passage of vehicular traffic to that unincorporated area only through the municipality. And the reason that I asked that question, you know, you, you look through this presentation and I think some of these property meets that criteria that you just uh, described, where all four sides are surrounded. And you look at some of these properties that have question marks, uh, and I would say that they're not totally encompassed by all four sides. So my recommendation would be to move forward on the properties uh, that have all four sides where there is basically an island in the middle of the city. 
And I think that that should be the methodology uh, if we are going to go down this path going forward that all four sides must be encompassed by city property. Uh, the other, like Rural T, some of the other ones, Matt Lachey Owls, it appears that all four sides are not encompassed. Uh, so maybe uh, I think we have to develop what the methodology of, of the enclave and how we're going to approach it. And that would give staff the direction I think that they're, that they're looking for. Additionally, as we all have heard here, is there's basically four vehicles that we can utilize as far as annexation. Uh, as we all know, back in 2003, that uh, we uh, attempted to use the legislation uh, process, uh, which is what I would agree with if we were going to move forward. Now, some of these, uh, uh, you know, when you look at the definitions or the requirements in each one of those particular cases, one being the county, I mean, there are there are uh, certain criteria that you have to meet as far as the voter population and the percentages. So, you know, that, uh, that may be an option to us. Uh, but for me, if we're going to go down this uh, course, I think the uh, uh, utilizing the, uh, the legislation would be the best, the best way moving forward. I will tell you that I spoke with one of our delegates today. And as the city manager mentioned, uh, if we decide to go down that path, uh, in a local bill, we have to have the support of the local delegation. Uh, the individual that I spoke with uh, stated that he feels that we do have that support through our local delegation, uh, but there is a criteria that we have to meet a lot of information that we're going to have to provide to them to even get to that point. And I think that's why staff is looking for that direction today because this isn't something that's going to occur next week. There's going to have to be a lot of data, uh, a lot of uh, research uh, that's going to take time. So I think that's why they're asking for that direction. Uh, so for me, uh, as long as all four sides are uh, surrounded by city property, uh, I would, that's my definition of an enclave. Um, so if that meets the criteria on any of these properties, then I would be for uh, incorporating them at least uh, in the research moving forward for staff to bring that additional information back to us. Council member Tate. Thank you. Um, just for my own information, the two chiefs um, that are in the back. So what happens exactly? Can you tell us uh, maybe future to get some statistics on how much time and money we spend um, servicing, specifically servicing places like the enclaves on south of Pun Island Road, like Royalty, Matt Lachey Isles, and some of those. Um, what are your hindrances, and, and how much time and, and money do we spend out there? Ryland Fire Chief. Um, so fire department's a little bit unique. Uh, the, the city covers 120 square miles. Uh, the fire department through uh, the Lee County Burnt Store MSTU covers 140 square miles, an additional 20 square miles roughly um, of what we call OPA or other protected area. Um, and you can kind of see that it covers the county line, Burnt Store Marina, most of the Yucapen, uh Sanctuary States, Eagle Road there to this area near Gator Circle. So that's uh, some additional area that the fire department covers in addition to the piece on Sand Road, um, the piece on Whispering Pine Lane. So we contractually provide service to um, those pieces of unincorporated Lee County through that agreement. Now certainly to other areas like you see here, um, we provide service to German American Club, Pine Island Mountain State Fire Department provides service to Bubba's Roadhouse, Saddlewood, we cover the Publix. There's this hopscotching as you see that. And as uh, you go to the other end of Pine Island Road here, you can see, for instance, Hibiscus Drive. In some cases, it's literally every other property. And so in those situations, um, right now, it, it is difficult on dispatchers to determine which resources you send. And so um, we don't have what we call auto aid agreements. We have mutual aid agreements. Uh, and, and the difference between the two is that they can't, Lee County cannot dispatch a fire department unit. They have to go through us, and then uh, we determine uh, the appropriate resources into the call, and because that's if that resource is available. 
for a mutual aid, uh, again, they, they call us, we say yes, we can provide the service and go versus just sending one of our trucks there. Uh, the reason for that is that some of our areas, we would routinely be providing service to areas that are not part of the city of Cape Coral. And so we're fortunate that council has provided us with a robust fire department and those some of those communities haven't decided to do that. So we don't want to really routinely provide service to areas that aren't the city. Um, and one of the dangers in sending, let's just send everybody, um, there's not about sending every resource to every call, it's about sending the right resources to the right calls, right? Because then when they're tied up on that, um, there's that other car accident or heart attack that comes in that we can't respond to or we have to send a truck that's further away. So there is um, problems um, with some of these enclaves, especially if I look into this next one here. We cover all the way out to uh, that Jug Creek area. And uh, again, when we're, really, when we're literally hopscotching property to property, that gets um, dicey for what we, can, what we can do there. Certainly we wanna be good neighbors, uh, but there is a um, hindrance in, in what we can uh, provide service-wise. Thank you. Tony Sizemore, police chief. Uh, very similar in what the fire chief said as far as the hopscotching. Uh, we were a little different in that our situations can go from benign to very dynamic very quickly. And if you're in the wrong property, essentially not in the city of Cape Coral, and you go to uh, what could be a verbal argument into a hands-on situation or worse, we run into some legal challenges where we, we're not in good standing on the soil that we're in. Um, we also run on a metric, as you guys are aware, of response time to priority one calls. And when there's confusion about, is this in the city, is this not? Um, for 24, almost 25 years, I've heard that chatter on the radio a lot. Uh, is that ours? And our dispatchers have to double check and geo verify. And when you're talking about emergency situations, seconds count, and that's, that's happened from very low priority calls all the way up to um, finding remains of a human to determine who investigates uh, this crime. So it does become cumbersome for us. Um, it's, a, it's a reality that we have to teach our new people, but uh, as growth has really exploded in the north end, it's becoming a more prevalent challenge for us. Thank you. Yeah, that is a concern. Um, so I would be supportive of moving forward with um, as the, did you want to? I just wanted to interrupt you for one oh, second before please. you go down the road that, that you were going down. I wanted um, either Jeff uh, Pearson or Paul Klingen, actually Paul Klingen, to come to the podium because you heard from the two chiefs. And so um, I'd like for you to also hear from your um, infrastructure chief in terms of what problems or headaches does, that, does this gerrymanding of boundaries present him as he's now trying to sit down and figure out North One and the UEP master plan. Right. And, uh, and just like this presents headaches for the two fire chiefs and hopscotching <coughs> over properties, it's the same issue with utilities, right? And so we're running water, sewer, and, and reuse lines in these areas, and we're having to jump over properties. properties. And so it's inefficient and it presents all kinds of issues. Paul. Uh, thank you, Paul Kling and Public Works. Um, I can present this one here. This was in North 2 uh, off of Nelson and those particular properties were not pulled into the assessment. So there's sewer going by uh, Nelson Road, but we didn't bring sewer down that particular road because they weren't included. And then we- now, If they had wanted it, could they have? So um, we current, our, by policy, excuse me, Paul, by policy, we currently do not provide water and sewer services beyond our municipal boundaries. boundaries. And in fact, we recently went through this, and I think Bob mentioned to you the, the most recent annexation we had, and it all started because they approached us and they wanted us to provide water and sewer, and we said to them that we are happy to do so, however, they need to annex into the city limits there was some debate going back and forth between the two parties there for, for a while. Um, and the city attorney um, worked with us and basically, you know, uh, we all concurred that we are under no obligation legally to provide services beyond our municipal boundaries. And we are not a public utility. We're in municipal government. So um, we were well within our rights to um, uh, essentially re uh, decline their request 
for services and ask them to annex in, which I'm sure we would have done there in those four parcels that, that Paul mentioned in Whispering Pines. But, but I wanted to, to also mention this, that one of the reasons you are investing or about to, to embark on a UEP master plan that's gonna cost three and a half billion dollars or, or so, on top of what you have already invested in this city is because ultimately your desire is to have everybody on city water and sewer. That is your policy. Once you run city water and sewer, you require that those properties tie into that service within a specific period of time. Well, here, using the previous example that Paul shared, you have the utility lines going right down the street because properties on one side of the street are in the city and they are obligated to pay the assessment and receive the services from the city. In this case, there's two homes. And then you have homes, developed properties on the south side that don't have that same obligation. And so again, it's a fairness issue. It's a, it's a, uh, it's, uh, for me, it's, it's about predictability. It's about ease of planning and ease of actually providing the services. Uh, so to expand on that, certainly from an engineering standpoint, point going by this, uh, and we have utilities all around there, so there's these properties here that have septic. And the goal would be is if, if these properties were annexed, we'd be able to assess them and provide them service. Uh, for example, we were just meeting, I'm sorry, going the wrong way. Uh, we were just meeting this morning, actually, on the North One uh, assessment. And you can see there's properties here that we'd have to wrestle with. We'd be putting bringing utilities right by them, and we're not able to uh, pull them into the assessment. So certainly, as far as the UEP, we'd uh, certainly encourage to try to get these properties so we could provide the sewer service and, and water and irrigation. Thank you. So for me, it would be um, helpful to have a prioritization list, um, one that encourages economic development or that would make economic development simp uh, easier, quicker, and um, the second would be the UEP. You know, what are the properties that are standing in the way of expanding the UEP quickly and, and identify those so we could look at the list and see where we stand with uh, those two situations. Is that feasible? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, for instance, if you go back to the Pine Island Road by the German American Club, um, if those properties want to develop, we don't do it, the developer would come in and do it through the county. The, the currently unincorporated properties? Yes. 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 So it, it, may get, it may take care of itself in some respect, in, in that corridor down there. It, it may, and it's looking more like that's it will. going to happen. Can you go back to the slide that shows the south? Because isn't that area completely different than if you look up here at the Pine Island Road area? I mean, or these these misfits, I would say, these odd pieces. If you go back to that Pine Island Road area where there's a whole bunch of it, where Knot Road and Sand Road, not Sand Road, yeah, right here. So do you think that these are going to take care of themselves? I think a few of them will, but it's not going to solve the overall issue. I think we are probably, I think I'm aware of three of these parcels, um, actually four, maybe even five, that are going through the annexation process. However, it doesn't solve the entire problem. It actually might even make it worse because now we will still have remnants of unincorporated properties in that general area. And so we're still gonna have to deal with, with those mm -hmm. headaches. But I, I just wanna talk to you about some of the challenges that we are uh, experiencing because we, you know, as you know, we've got, there's significant economic development interest in this particular area that's, that's before you. And certainly on the south side of Pine Island Road, we are working with two developers that are um, um, planning some, some large scale and um, economic de development uh, uh, important projects for the city. And you have a neighborhood completely to the south that because they're unincorporated, they're not part of the process. 
And as such, my understanding is that they have made certain demands of the developers and they're threatening legal action and so on and so forth. And because they're unincorporated and they're not part of the process, they almost don't have any standing for us to step in and help us um, try to uh, maneuver some sort of resolution to the dispute between them and the development. And as I explained to at least one resident of that area, our obligation and our responsibility is to the property owners are, are within the city of Cape Coral. And so we told them that we're gonna focus on their needs first and foremost before we start prioritizing the needs of this, resi of this residential community over the needs um, uh, for the two developers within our city. And so again, if they were within the city, you know that you know the city council is very responsive to the to the issues affecting our neighborhoods. And I really don't think we would have this problem because you would you would either work with them as representatives of the governing body, or you would direct us, um, much like you directed us to do down in Cape Harbor, where we've got some some disagreement between residents and the developer. You look for you look to us to help at least convene people to the table where we can have a discussion and help resolve the issues. And so we're not having that there. And, um, and, and again, I'm hoping that this doesn't, you know, um, become full fledged conflict that ends up delaying development along Pine Island road. But again, our obligation is to our residents. And so okay. that's a drawback to them that I didn't, that I mentioned, you know, had you annexed into the city, you know, back in 2003, you know, your voices would be heard certainly um, with staff and um, not speaking for council, but I th would think that their voices would be heard um, b by you because you know, they're, they're your residents. Well, we did hear 2003 loud and clear. So I would say on the record, I am not interested in, in royalty or Mount Lache Isles. But if you could prioritize the other properties uh, for us, at least for me, um, as into economic development and utility expansion for the UEP, I would be interested in seeing So that. essentially what you're asking for is a, um, an annexation strategy, if you will. Yes. And, 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 and I'm glad you're giving me that direction because that's exactly what we're thinking. And so we are happy to, to sit down and, and pencil that out for you and begin working on that and then bringing, um, hopefully getting direction from you today as to how do you want to proceed uh, moving forward, because if this is something that you want to bring before the state legislature in 2023, it, this basically means that we have to have all of our work done and appropriate cow discussions. And if we need to have public hearings and so forth, all of that has to be done sometime before September of next year. And so it's think feasible. About it, it's not a whole lot of time. So it's feasible that you could get us that information on, on the properties for economic development versus yes. utilities yes. quickly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. I'm not going to repeat what my fellow teammates have said, um, Mr. City Manager. However, I, in addition to what Councilmember Tate said in terms of um, your annexation plan, if you will, um, I would also like to see the benefits in terms of how it's benefiting the city, how it's benefiting the county, like pros and cons, and how it's benefiting the residents or the businesses, say, you know, that we want to come in and, and annex. Because I think that'll make it less controversial or maybe diminish a little bit of the conflict if we can show things like, like first responder uh, service uh, call time, um, time response. Um, and, um, you know, I just want to see how it's going to affect all the stakeholders involved. I think that's important, especially if we communicate this out moving forward. Um, I think it's just important um, to piggyback on what the mayor said regarding the enclaves. I agree it's pretty clear cut. Um, interlocal agreements seem to be the, the uh, path of least resistance because I think you can get um, agreement. But again, I think it would be helpful to have, you know, those benefits analysis sort of of these enclave properties, how it's going to benefit all the stakeholders, because I think it would be helpful um, for us to see as well. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Welsh. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, I'll try to be quick. I think that all the properties outlined in red uh, that we didn't put question marks on, we should go ahead and go go ahead and, and start the process. I don't see it being a bad thing. They are using city roads, they are using city services, and they should be within the city. So um, 
one step further on that. If you could go to the picture that shows the piece on just Pine Island Road uh, near Nicholas, the one you had mentioned that has a nope. billboard on it. I, we had that same issue with the billboard at the, the property that wanted to annex in and they had to remove it. I believe that the billboard company owns this property. So they're probably not gonna be happy that they're gonna have to lose their billboard to come into the city of Cape Coral, but is there a way that we can work with property owners to allow them to keep their properties the way they are, but then uh, still become part of the city? So where that billboard has been there for 25 years or 20 years, uh, what would need to happen in order to let them keep their billboard there, but then also not break our other code? So that, that would be a question or maybe someone could look at because they might, they might be willing to just voluntarily join the city if they can have that. Mr. Mayor, we, uh, well, certainly we could look at that detail. And what's interesting about this site, if you look at it, and we'd have to do a little more research for the actual surveys and property, but you'll see there's actually drawn in here two little, a little sliver of land that's a separate parcel. And the best we can determine absent a survey is that billboard is right down there uh, in that white space that's right at the southern end of that sliver of property. So the, the bulk of the property uh, is, certainly has a lot of development potential and that would limit, potentially limit the billboard issue just to that little sliver of property. So that, that will require some additional research, but we can certainly do that. Yeah, and, and like I said, it's gonna take a lot of time to put all this together. But if we can eliminate some of these with voluntary annexations, maybe reaching out to the property owner and explaining what we're trying to do and that it could go further, uh, that might be less paperwork we have to do or, or just reach out on certain aspects like that. I don't know what we've done, but that could be another avenue to, to bring some of these properties in. Uh, back to the, the question mark ones, I do wanna ask the police chief a question uh, in regards to royalty. So who currently services uh, police in royalty? Uh, Lee County Sheriff's Office. So Lee County Sheriff's Office also services uh, Mount Lachey and Pine Island, correct? Correct. So do they have officers that routinely patrol Pine Island? Would you say, and, or do they have officers that routinely patrol in Cape Coral as well near that area? I know for a fact they do in Pine Island um, and I, I really can't speak to, to their deployment outside of that. So, I mean, typically if, if there was an issue in royalty, we would definitely be able to service them much faster than an officer coming from Pine Island and having to go all that distance for a dispute. So, whereas I know there was a lot of, uh, thank you, that was basically it. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from Matt Lachey uh, about the annexation. There was a lot of pushback from royalty about the annexation, but I'm not scared to try with royalty. Um, it's going to be citizens, um, you know, it's, it's going to have to happen eventually. So I would like to see the red ones go first. Let's do this in pieces, see how they go, and then maybe revisit royalty for another legislative section. And, and, and I agree with you, and that's our recommendation. Uh, ideally, we want to do the, the cleanup of, uh, of these parcels primarily along, you know, the Pine Island Road corridor and in areas where we know UEP is going. And, and you know, I guess you can refer to them as the low-hanging fruit. Those are the ones that, you know, absolutely make sense, and there's probably not a whole lot of emotions behind moving forward with those annexations. Once we start talking about some of these other neighborhoods that are developed, um, people have emotional attachment to it, then it becomes a little bit more challenging. And so I think that that's certainly a conversation that we um, are more than happy to have with you, but our recommendation is that we stay away from that at the moment because that becomes much more complicated for us. And, and let's, let's go after the ones that we know make complete sense um, and we think that we, won't, we can probably get legislative support and, um, and support uh, from the property owners themselves in, in many of these. And so let's, let's focus on those first um, and then once we get that done, then we can move on and have the conversation about some of these other areas. Thank you. Council Member Shepard. Yeah, I agree with the city manager. But I do have one question. The, the three properties with the question mark, 
any of them properties have septics? <clears throat> I think they all do, do they not? Yeah, royalty does, I know. Yeah. basically in our house and, and they're polluting and we don't have a say in speaking to that problem. Anything else? So, you know, that, that, that's a concern of mine. But I'm for, for moving forward the way that you would like to move forward, but I do have concerns with them areas because, you know, we, we get blamed for polluting areas and, and the these three locations are pretty much in our city and you know we're going to get blamed for for their pollution basically thank you council member Coston. thank you mayor council member shepherd i think you're right but i think we need to go in a priority process like sure, yeah that. so uh, that would be my recommendation is to start with the low-hanging fruit i guess um look at economic development and utilities first and then eventually i do think these Big ones are going to be really tough, though. It's going to be a fight, I think. So I don't want to go there yet. But I think what everyone else has already said, I agree with. Thank you. So if, if I may, I just want to like to make a comment. So I think that, you know, this opposition that may have come from neighborhoods in the past is, is, um, op is opposition that is not necessarily rooted in fact, right? And I think that many people feel that or they oppose annexation into Cape Coral because they feel that they're going to pay considerably more in taxes and life is going to be more difficult and things of and things of that nature and 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 I don't necessarily think that that's true you know the cost of the cost of government services for the most part is equal between you know the county and 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 the city what what differentiates is the level of service that you receive Right. And so if you're in one of these neighborhoods um, and you have a choice between receiving services from the city of Cape Coral's fire department and it's soon to be 13 stations and all of the resources that that comes with. And as city council said, it's very important to you to have staffing of at least four persons on a fire engine. That's a higher level of service than some of these neighborhoods are getting where in certain cases they may have a fire truck show up with only two people and that's all they have. And if it's a large enough incident, they're going to have to call for help from somebody and more likely than not, it's going to be Cape Coral fire that, that responds. And it's the same thing with police protection. I'm not casting any um, negative comments on the sheriff's office, a fantastic organization, but clearly Cape Coral has more resources available. Um, in proximity to these neighborhoods. And so it's all about service. It's all about um, ensuring, you know, uh, protection of development quality. It's also about environmental quality, as, as you mentioned. And, um, and that's something that's important to us because you are a provider of municipal services, whereas where they are now, they're not exactly um, in an organization uh, or being governed by an organization that's so focused is municipal service. And so I think we have to start chipping away at some of those um, um, uh, misperception about what life in, in city, uh, in, city uh, in a formal city is like and start chipping away of the fact that it's so much more expensive to be in city government because it isn't. And as um, when you look at the issue countywide, as areas annex slowly, you know, they you slowly chip away at the unincorporated area, there will be a time where it is going to be increasing, increasingly more cost prohibitive for the county to be able to provide services in isolated pockets like this. It's one thing when you have large geographic areas of unincorporated communities, but when you're talking pockets like this, it becomes very expensive for the county. And eventually that cost is going to be um, um, passed on to those very same residents who are trying to avoid those costs to begin with. So 
we'll work on the pros and cons and, and, and um, illustrate the benefits to residents uh, of those areas ultimately coming into the, into the city. Thanks. Councilmember Shepard. Yeah, there's other things that we're not bringing up, like uh, the Royal T, uh, for instance, that I'm sure there's a lot of children that live there that use our charter school. And the taxpayers of the city of Cape Borough are contributing to supporting the charter school. So, you know, are these other areas that, you know, where they're, they're getting privileges but aren't paying for them? So with respect to the charter school, I'd have to look into that to determine if they would be eligible to, to attend the city's charter schools. Um, they, they cannot. Yeah, residents of Cape Coral. Madam City Attorney. Originally, they had to be uh, re residents of Cape Coral, but there have been changes in the state statutes which enable students to even pick another county to go to uh, as long as there's room and they're not necessarily prioritized and they provide their own transportation and things like that, you can't keep them out of, of a um, program. They don't necessarily get priority, as I said. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, are, you, are you done, Councilman? Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is uh, uh, a process that will probably take several steps uh, moving forward. Uh, that's why I said originally in the beginning, develop that criteria of the first step and then move forward from there. Uh, for me personally, uh, at some point, you know, it makes sense if royalty and some of these other uh, Matt Lachey Isles, that was a good point that Council Member Shepard brought up about the septic systems. If you look at the uh, Matt Lachey Isles there, one side of the canal is the city, the other side of the canal is septic. You know, so that is a, a, a another concern. Uh, and I know that, uh, you know, we're spending millions of dollars each year in order to, to go from a, a septic to a, uh, a the sewer. So I think that's an uh, important uh, point to make. So I think, uh, you know, I, I'm in favor of, of moving down that this path, understanding that it's gonna be several steps. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the economic uh, impact, if you look at uh, public safety, which is what the police chief and the fire chief had, had mentioned, uh, UEP, I mean, there's many, many factors here that I think that, that weigh in on this. Uh, and also I think it's important to note, like uh, I heard earlier, if someone wanted to do and uh, incorporate a city today, some of these enclaves wouldn't be allowed. So. Uh, you know, when you look back at some of the fights that some of us had mentioned back in 2003, it's almost 19 years ago. A lot has changed in 19 years. Uh, our services have changed in 19 years. Uh, so I think uh, revisiting this in the future, uh, I think, uh, you know, it will come forward and we'll have to have that discussion whatever that point in time is. That may be while we're here or that may be a future council. Uh, but I think that discussion will come up eventually. Uh, so I agree, uh, you know, to move forward now in steps, and I think that would be the, the best approach. Uh, Mr. City Manager, did you get the direction that you're looking for? Yes, I believe so. Okay. All righty. Next item on the agenda is roundtable discussion. Uh, there's nothing listed. Uh, Council Member Tate. Um, I had asked prior to, and I got a notice today from the Yacht Club uh, project park update. I'd like to workshop that just a little bit on a committee at the whole. I'm quite concerned about closing down everything for two years. I know we've talked about it. Um, you had mentioned that you would bring it back to us to discuss. I had a conversation with the Kearns group. It's completely different than um, he and I had, than what he said you and staff had. So I'd really like to air that out just a little bit before um, we get too far, because I guess this went out to the whole community that we're shutting everything down as of March 31st. So yeah, I have some big concerns about that. So right now, Mr. Mayor, you're scheduled to receive the next Parks Geo Bond uh, quarterly report at a um, workshop in December. Um, do you wanna wait until then? Um, we only have one in November, and that one's going to be dedicated to the UEP. 
well, then we really don't have a choice. We'll do it in December. That's fine. I, it's too late now because this already went out. So I would have preferred it not gone out until we all had a chance to talk about it. But since it did, then let's just do it in December. I just want to do it before I start getting phone calls since it's in my district. And everybody else is in that respect. So I guess we'll uh, break that back in December. I think we're all going to get phone calls either way. We are going to yeah. get phone calls. So it doesn't matter what, what choice we decide, how we're going to move forward. We will get phone calls. Yeah, yeah. So I think we do need, need to workshop it. So. But uh, maybe that's a discussion we can have in December. Okay. And get staff's recommendation, uh, how they want to proceed on that. Okay. And then direction from council. Okay. Seeing no other uh, roundtable discussions, time and place of the future meeting. We have an executive session. A shade meeting will be held, conference room 220A on Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021 at 3 p.m. regarding uh, I IT security. Uh, the meeting is closed to the public pursuant to section 281.301 of the Florida statute. Also, that particular day, uh, we have an exec executive session, a shade meeting, which will be held conference room 220A on Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021 at 3.30 p.m. for collective bargaining. Uh, this meeting will also be closed pursuant to section 447.605 of the Florida statute. And also we have a regular meeting of the Cape Coral City Council scheduled for Wednesday, November 3rd at 4.30 p.m. in council chambers. Do we have a motion for adjournment? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Meeting adjourned.